Thanks for coming. It certainly has meant a lot to me to see people here who mean a lot to me, and you all do as collaborators, as I work with you as students, etc., and to see all your work. When I look at all your work and hear all your papers, it suddenly occurs to me that I never told anybody <laughs> what to do. Because you've all done totally different things, <laughs> totally different from what I tended to do. Okay, that's the way it is. Uh, I do tend to believe that it's good to let people do what they want to do and to encourage them to do it. One final word, because it was occurring to me, you know, in terms of uh, new things, and, and I thought that was a very nice kind of uh, stimulation going back. One thing that to me is very interesting, and I certainly got from the conference um, the papers this morning, for example, um, and that is that there is a fundamental change going on, which we'd have to look at very carefully. You know, when we're talking about the 50s and 60s, well, in, in the work we're doing on migration now, and early migrations in the 30s and 40s, you see it more clearly, you're talking about family economies. What that means is that though the family has very different roles, you know, men, women, children, etc., even the parents and so on and so forth, they are all, you know, they're all identified with that family unit. That family unit will differentiate right, according to in cities or rural areas, what class they are, and so on. Now, in that situation, singling out something like gender is not going to be done. It would be done by people like Condorcet in the Enlightenment, but that was talking about, you know, a very unusual situation of a very upper class, you know, French, enlightened French man, who did see that women should have, you know, their own identities, their own way forward. But typically, when you're talking about family economies, no, gender is not going to be an issue. But what is, to me, increasingly apparent from, you know, what I'm hearing and what people are finding, is that what we're getting now is the increasing individualization of, of identities within families. We've seen it, that you know, increasingly the number of single, single person households, two person households, and of course, you know, as, as we heard this morning about, you know, <clears throat> same, same gender households, etc., etc., all of these, all implying that increasingly there is an atomization in relationships. Shouldn't exaggerate it, but still, the family unit in defining the identity, uh, you know, and the class identity of a person, etc., disappears. And so what you get now is that other identities are going to be much more salient in making for life. Now that does seem to me to be a change. And many of the things we see, I think, you know, can be seen as, you know, emerging from that, you know, fairly structural change. You're all going to do the work on this, and it's going to be complicated work and interesting work, etc. And, and there the history does, does help, because when you go back and you look then at how the families operated then and begin to see how they operate over the generations, the way they perceive what their duties and obligations are, who, what they should be looking at, etc. And that's partly collaborating with people in CSS, not the people, my friends in CSS. They're collaborating with, with my friends in CSS, you can see the difference in the way migrant families, for example, change their strategies over time. And, you know, Meche, of course, has talked a bit about, talked about that too, the individualization of, of, of people's roles. Now, that was just one thought, just occurred to me. Guatemala, and I'll end on that note, I promise you. Uh, yes, it's interesting, and I'm delighted to be part of Peter's project, because I'm certainly learning a lot from that. Um, change. My book, Organizing Strangers, was finally, and that was my negligence, translated into Spanish. And they gave it a book reading um, about a, just over a year ago in Guatemala City. Now Guatemala, unlike 
the time I was working there, has actually some very competent social scientists, sociologists, planners, urbanists, etc., etc. And they, they did me the service of actually reading and commenting on the book in detail. And it was a backhanded compliment. Because the major message they said was, what we find, and it's amazing, is that nothing has changed. The way you analyze <laughs> what, what was going on in the neighborhoods in, in Guatemala City is exactly what's going on today. Now, admittedly, today you have violence, which is an added element that's, that's you know, maybe stopping the kind of evolution and change. But the idea that actually politics in Guatemala, no, absolutely not changed whatsoever. No citizenship in Guatemala, no. You know, it's, you know, there's nothing you can say in a country like Guatemala, okay, progress, enlightenment, hope, etc. So I just close off that, as a, as a, and hoping that you know, other people rush back and find out the good news and that, that there, are, there are kinds of change, or, and of course, more secretly, you know, more, more, more positively, you know, work with others to, you know, and, and Guatemalans, of course, to try to produce you know, better changes. But, okay, yes, we need historical benchmarks, don't always expect there to be really significant change, but on certain dimensions there will be. And anyway, for us at all, it's a fascinating world to know about. And we have to keep optimistic. <laughs> okay, thank you all, and really have enjoyed your company and you being here, and thank you.